Welcome to Anchors of Truth. From the 3 AVN Worship Center, The Truth As It Is in Jesus, with Ron Halverson. Hello and welcome to the 3 ABN Worship Center, and thank you for joining us for Anchors of Truth. I also just want to say a big thank you for those of you around the world that are watching and supporting, praying for 3 ABN, supporting us financially as we endeavor to take this gospel of the kingdom into all the world. I'm thankful for our home church, for those of you that come week after week, those of you that support, many of you work at 3 ABN, many of you from the communities. Uh, this has been a great series. Uh, Elder Gill Gilly and I think John and CA and a number of others said we need something and we've been talking about our pillars of faith. Uh, we've done a pillars of faith series of music. We've done a pillars hymns and they said we need to keep getting truth out to the world because that's what we as Seventh-day Adventists believe that our message is is to take present truth into all the world. Am I right? And so we can do that in a number of ways. And uh, one of the ways is to take advantage of the wonderful facility that God has given us right here in southern Illinois, West Frankfort, Thompsonville area, the 3 ABN Worship Center, that we literally have the cameras, the equipment, and can take this gospel of the kingdom around the world. I'm amazed that this signal will go up today 22,300 miles to space. It'll hit 10 different satellites around the world and virtually anywhere on planet Earth uh, where there's people in inhabited continents people will get this signal and can watch it. I've been in those recently. It was down in Australia and New Zealand. Could watch 3ABN halfway around the world. It took me 30 some hours from the time I left home to get there. But you turn on the channel, Joe, and it's a good crisp channel coming out. Those of you out here, you know that work at 3ABN. Good clear pictures everywhere. I was in Chile some time ago with Jorge and others. And we saw the signals down there. So God is blessed. And we have a message to take to the world. It's the undiluted three angels' messages, one that would counteract the counterfeit. And today, Elder Halverson is part of that. We have our, as our speaker, formally introducing him. He's a prayer coordinator for It Is Written. Says he's going to Las Vegas to do prayer walks for the upcoming series there. But he's also an author as well as an evangelist. He has a Gangs to God. That's a very interesting book. It's a great book. His story is incredible and also Prayer Warriors, which all of us need to read this to be, I think it helps tune us up for the power of prayer. And so Elder um, Halverson and his wife, I'm glad that she's here. I hadn't really met her before, but we've had some time to get to know each other. Wonderful people, wonderful man of God, a couple of God who has been in evangelism for 50 some years. The devil has tried to kill him in a number of ways, but he's still here, still giving the gospel message to the world. That's what it's all about, isn't it? What I'm going to do is ask you at home, if you want to, those of you here, if you want to bow your heads with me today, we're going to ask God's blessings on this program. Heavenly Father, we thank you today for your blessings and your love and your plan of salvation for this beautiful Sabbath day that we can worship you. And Lord, we pray today for the anointing of your Holy Spirit upon everything that's said and done in this service today, and we pray that you will bless Elder Halverson as he's never been blessed before. And those that are listening around the world, you've already prepared their hearts, our hearts, because no matter how long we've been serving you, there's always something that we can do to draw closer to you and help us to be open today to the truth that we'll be hearing today about salvation in you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. They've asked me to sing a song, and I'm going to do a little song that the Lord gave me this past year entitled, All My Praise. <clears throat> give you all my praise that's all I have to offer you I now build a sanctuary so deep within my heart and all my praise I offer up to you. I love you, Lord. Oh, how 
I love you, Lord. I bear my heart and soul to you. I'm an empty, broken vessel filled with hurt and pain inside. Still I offer up all my praise to you. Fill me, Lord. Oh, please fill me, Lord, with your It's beautiful, isn't it? Amen. Give more our praise. Give more our praise. First, I want to take a little time to welcome our viewing audience, wherever they are around the world. We welcome you to this very special series on Anchored in the Truth as it is in Jesus. This is the fourth in a series of five. This afternoon at 3 o'clock, I'll expound the Word of God and take you back again to the Jesus and the promise coming again. When the New Testament Christians met, they used to say, Maranatha, Maranatha, Jesus is coming again. I don't know about you, but I'm excited as I've been looking at Jesus and seeing Him in a different way every evening and, and, and afternoon, this afternoon. I'm looking forward to it. I love to talk about Jesus. In fact, I was at a church, and I'd been there about two, two years, and, and after I had finished preaching about Jesus, I came off the platform, and a woman came up to me, and she looked a little agitated, and, well, she was flat mad, I guess, but anyway, she said, Pastor, all you do is preach about Jesus. I said, thank you, ma'am, and I went on my way. <laughs> what else is worth preaching? Every Bible message should begin and end with Jesus. Today's message perhaps will shock you and some of you, and perhaps if you like these pretty little messages with bubbling brooks and, you know, positive attitudes and, and sweet and sugary words, this sermon's not for you. The truth about radical grace. Let's bow our heads in a word of prayer. Gracious Father, I thank you for the love of Christ, for the Lord that brings us together from different walks of life, from different churches from different areas of theology to bring us together in one purpose, and that's to know Jesus Christ better. I pray, God, that you'll speak to us through your word as you've spoken to me as I wrote these words down. And now bless this service to your honor, to your glory, until the day we look in your face, in Christ's name, amen and amen. 
My text this morning is taken from the book of Ephesians. It's one of the great texts of the entire New Testament. In fact, for no, one, not one text do we have that explains the eternal gospel as this text. This text describes the good news. This text describes and destroys work religion. In fact, the Bible says right here in Ephesians, the second chapter, for by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. The Bible tells us clearly in those words. Some years ago, I had the privilege of, of attending a, a Sabbath school with my grandson. He was 14 years old, and, and he was into the guitar at the time, and he had dedicated his guitar to the Lord, and, and so he's going to play special music at Sabbath school. So I said, I'm going to go be with my grandson and listen to that magnificent solo. And so anyway, I arrived at the Sabbath school, and he did a great job, let me tell you. Because you see, there's an overriding principle, and it comes from the text. It's not how perfect it's played that matters. It's who plays it that matters. He's my grandson. And that's true of our spiritual life. It isn't your ability, it's your relationship. I stayed in his class and proudly sat with him for the entire lesson. A squeaky clean, middle-aged man, black suit, dull tie, and harsh countenance taught his lesson. He thumped away at the kids for 40 minutes the rules and the laws and obedience and the standards and the rules and the laws and obedience, character development. I still wonder how we can develop bad characters, make them better? That's English. No, that's Brooklynese. <laughs> I know it's not good English. But anyway, either is that thinking good theology? Well, anyway, at the end of the 40 minutes of listening, hoping he would end boring... His lecture, his lecture on do's and don'ts is cultish Christianity. He ended with this. I'll never forget it. Now remember, boys and girls, God loves good boys and girls. And he sat down. I wanted to stand up. I mean, I wanted to refute that gospel. Like Paul the Apostle did in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 4 when he wrote these words and, and said these things. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus whom we have not preached, or if ye receive another spirit which ye have not received, he says, another spirit of another gospel which ye have not accepted, ye might well bear with me. Another gospel. I wanted to read the text in Ephesians and numerous other texts that totally refute all he was saying to those kids. Bible text, which by the way was lacking in the presentation. Christ, which was lacking in the presentation. But I shouldn't have been surprised. I mean, I wasn't, it wasn't new to me. I've been in this for 50 years. I heard it before. I heard it from saintly preachers, sanctimonious preachers, laying their hands on little kids' heads, saying, God loves good little boys and girls. Sweet, sugary words of advice. I've been quiet long enough. I've watched from a distance. I've listened to the crowd and tried to, as my mother said, hold your tongue, son. But I can't any longer. My heart is sick. So I cannot be silent any longer. I'm totally sick of seeing kids and adults being manipulated, emotionally abused, intimidated by some pious fanatic who thinks because they have memorized a few quotations that they have a right to judge others. Injuring godly pastors, injuring godly administrators, Injuring church members. God does love good little boys and good little girls. But he loves bad little boys and bad little girls. And there are more of them than there are the good. 
Perhaps if the bad little girls and the bad little boys knew that, they would be better boys and better girls. And that's what makes Christian God so loving and so different from all the gods of works. You see, this sermon is what I call in-your-face type of sermon. I mean, I mean, it's a kind of sermon, it won't be accepted by some. I mean, especially the self-righteous, the pious, the holier-than-thou. I mean, it's not for the super spiritual elder that I found in one camp meeting recently who told me he hadn't sinned in five months. I said, you just did. The Bible says if you say you've not sinned, you're a liar. The truth is not in you. Excuse me. And I walked away. I walked away. They wouldn't listen anyway. It's not for the minister who abused their children by dressing them as if they lived in another century, another age, humiliating them. I mean, acting as if their, their dress will assure them a place in the kingdom of God. They wouldn't listen anyway. It's not for the conference employee who, who thinks himself or herself or church leader themselves important and godly because they run the church. I mean, they wouldn't listen anyway. It's not for those who stayed away from the crowd or the world afraid that they might become like the world instead of changing the world. They wouldn't listen anyway. It isn't for the red-hot zealer who boasts all the time about his good works and the commandments I've kept from my youth. I mean, we've read that in a word. It's not for the fearless or the tearless. It's not for the complacent or the hoisting over their shoulders a, a tote bag full of honors and degrees as if education, as if knowledge will get them into the kingdom of heaven. It's not for, they won't listen anyway. It's not for the legalist, surely, who, who would rather do it right than do it at all. I mean, who sweat it out, who work it out, who try harder and harder and harder. I mean, and make it harder on us. who live by the laws and rules as if the laws and rules give them right to enter the kingdom of God, thinking they're right and everybody else is wrong, and they're good and everybody else is evil, who are fanatical and, and who are not really faithful, I mean, strong in the way they feel about things, but not strong in the way they feel about people's feelings. I mean, they won't listen anyway. Then who is this message for? As you listen on, look at on television, listen to the Word of God on radio, then who is this message for? It's the beat up. It's for the bruised. It's for the battered. It's, it's for the burned out and the, and the burdened. It's for, it's for the inconsistent. It's for the wobbly, weak-kneed church member and leader and Christian who don't have it all together. I mean, it's, it's for the poor and the weak and, and, and the hereditary faults that limit talents. It's, I mean, it's for people, ordinary people like you and me, everyday people, type of pe earthen vessels, I mean, who shuffle along on feeble feet of clay. Who is this message for? It's for the bent over people, the bruised people. It's for that mother in a tenement who trying to raise five kids in a Christian atmosphere in a world of crack cocaine in a world of drive-by shootings in a world. It's for those who feel their lives are a grave disappointment to God. And it's for those who know they're stupid and down deep they know they're scallywags because they do look in the mirror. Now for you today, this message will either bring joy and hope and to those it will bring joy and hope, but others only anger. Most of all, it will be the truth. By the way, present truth. For Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And it's called radical grace. It's what brought Sims to know Christ. I went to Hawaii. The other night I told you how the... The brethren used to send me to the hard cities and they'd go to the Philippines. They'd go to 10,000, they'd send me to preach to 100 in the inner city. But anyway, my friend called me to Hawaii and I went to Hawaii and as I do in all my evangelistic crusades, I, I pray a walk. And I always pray for the meanest, toughest, snortness, fightness person in the city because they make the best disciples. And so I was praying that God would bring the meanest, toughest, snortness, fightness 
person to, to the meeting and that they might get saved and give their life to Christ. And about the second night, in walked Sims, a Samoan. I mean a big Samoan. And those Samoans are really big. If you listen to me in Samoa, listen, you are big. And he came boom, boom, boom down to the front. I said, Lord, here's the meanest, toughest, lookingest, snortingest. You answered my prayer. And all that night I preached. I preached only to the Samoan. A thousand, two hundred, two hundred people, a thousand, two hundred people there, and yet I preached to the Samoan. And after the meeting, he came out. And I'm going to use you a hugger, but whoa, this guy. It took me days to get enough courage to put my arms halfway around him. That's Samoan. But I wish you'd been there when God took hold of his heart. It's for the sins of the world. When God came into his life and, and Jesus took control of his life. I wish you had been there. You didn't need to tell him what to do. The Holy Spirit, why are we trying to take away the work of the Holy Spirit? The great problem with the church today, you don't want to catch fish. You want to clean them. That was worth coming to church for. <laughs> Sims came forward, gave his life to Christ. And you know, I don't have five-day plans, 10-day plans, help people with their tobacco, their alcohol, their drugs. I have a five-minute plan. It's found in the book of James, the anointing. I wish you'd been there when he brought his crack and he brought his marijuana. I wish you'd been there when he brought his fists of alcohol. I wish you'd been there when he brought his shopping bag and he wanted to be saved and, and, and set free from that. And I wish you'd been there when I prayed and tears streamed down his face. And I wish you had been there. When the Lord delivered him, that young man, in his first year with the youth group, they baptized over 100 people in the kingdom of God. I just got a phone call from a few months ago. He started an evangelistic meeting. He called me just a few weeks ago. He said, Pastor Ron, he says, I'm, I, I really feel a burden to go into ministry. And Will you pray for me? I'm praying for him that God will provide for him so he can go become a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'll tell you, it's for the down and out. It's for the downtrodden. It's for those who realize in their heart, without God, they're lost, they're damned, they're doomed, and they're bound for hell. He discovered radical grace, something the church in many quarters have yet to discover. In many quarters of the church today accepts grace in theory but denies it in practice. We say we believe in the reality of grace, but we don't act it. First time I saw grace, I was a little boy in Brooklyn, and I was always in trouble. My mother used to say to me, oh, you're always in trouble. And I was walking by the school, it was after school hours, and and I saw a big rock, and I picked it up, and I saw the windows, and you know. <laughs> and I stood back and threw the rock through the window. And I started to laugh, and I started to run, and I ran right into the arms of the Irish cop from 60th Precinct. <laughs> he lifted me up, and my legs and feet were still moving. Still moving. And he said, young man, you just threw a rock through the window. I said, I didn't do that, officer. Come on now. He said, I saw you. You're going down to the precinct. You're going to jail, young man. Jail. And as he was carrying me towards the 60th precinct, my feet moving, he said, and I thought, whoa, jail. Black and white stripes. My dad would come down. Oh, no. But then I thought, oh no, not my dad. My mom will come down. <laughs> and up the steps to the 60th precinct, and just as we got to the door, he set me down. He looked in my eyes, he said, young man, will you ever do that again? No, officer, no. He said, all right, go ahead. And I ran as fast as I could, and I ran toward home. Never again, come on. <laughs> come on. Grace. An Irish cop taught me grace. Unconditional. Go on now. Don't do it again. Grace is the unmerited favor of God 
given what? Freely to sinners. We all know that. We quote it. We use it to our own benefit. But in all practicality, we deny the unconditional giving and such unconditional love. We talk glibly about grace as a gift and then go on with the buts, but, but what's my part? But what's what, but, 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 the character stuff. We're like the Wall Street exchange of works where our gospel is just for the elite. The elite are honored and, and the ordinary are ignored. David G. Benner, in his book, Surrender to Love, page 46, says this. Grace, listen carefully, grace is totally alien to human psychology. He goes on to explain. We want to get our house in order, come on now, and then let God love and accept us. The psychology of works, righteousness and self-certification is fundamental or foundational to human psyche and totally at odds with grace. You can say you believe in grace and spend the rest of your life trying to pay for it. But unconditional love always demands surrender. Example, person wanting to be baptized. He delays it. He puts off. Don't know enough. As if knowledge will give him the kingdom of heaven. Oh, I can't live that life. As if our living, our living will give us that life. Well, uh, I have too many sins in my life, as if everybody baptized didn't have sin. I guess that's the reason I'm baptized, because I have sin. <laughs> oh, no, I can't be baptized. The real reason is our fear of love. Our natures resist unconditional love. We want to contribute to the deal, come on now, of eternal life. My faith, my effort, my love, my belief. But the bottom line is that perfect love, grace, grace love, meets me where I am and asks only I open my heart to receive the love which I long for, which I need. I mean, surrender is the hardest thing for us. And because we do not really trust in God's grace, our love is stifled. Our freedom is shackled. Our lives refute our faith. Now, there's some things obvious about the text. You don't have to be a theologian or think you'll be a theologian. It's clear as clear that we often overlook it. Men especially suffer from this, overlooking things. Come on. You know, looking for something, not finding it. Honey, here I am at the drawer. I can't find my socks. She comes in. <laughs> Dear, where are my keys? 54 years of this. Here. Something right in front of you, you miss it. Come on. Let's look at the text carefully, with open minds, open hearts. Listen, put away your prejudices. You are this group, and this is this group, and that's that group, and, and then the liberals, and then the moderates, and then the conservatives, and who's who, who's what. Forget that stuff. And let's look at the text from a heart of need. Because we may not all sin alike, but alike we all sin. Well, I should have more amens here, but maybe, maybe I'm speaking to the wrong group. I want you to have spiritual insight and clear vision. To divine grace, simply let me tell you a story. Jesus had a way of doing that. He took complicated things and made them simple. We two evangelists today, I mean, we take simple things and make them complicated. Have you noticed that? Come on. We spend more time talking about angels than we do about Christ. We spend more time about the Pope than about Christ. We know more about the 144,000, so we think, than we do about Christ. Let me tell you a true story. It happened in my city, New York, a long time ago. Mayor LaGuardia. He served as mayor of New York City 
through World War II. He was called Little Flower because he wore a little button flower here on his lapel. He wore a sombrero, so you know he was a different individual. He was a colorful character. He used to ride the New York City fire trucks, and, and he used to raid the speakeasies, I mean, with the police. I mean, he was so unusual, yet everyone loved him. But he'd take all, whole orphanages to the ball game. That's Mayor LaGuardia. And I mean, and when the newspaper went on strike, he read the funnies over the radio to the little children throughout the city. I mean, he was well loved, and you can understand why. One bitterly cold night in January 1935, the mayor turned up at the night court that served the poorest ward of the city. LaGuardia dismissed the judge and took the place. There a tattered old lady came and was brought in before him, charged with stealing a loaf of bread. She told LaGuardia that her daughter's husband had deserted her, her daughter was sick, and her two grandchildren were starving, so she stole the loaf of bread. Now the shopkeeper, he was very angry because he was getting ripped off, I guess, and he says, she has to be shown, Your Honor, she has to be punished to teach other people a lesson. LaGuardia sighed. He turned to the woman and said, I have to punish you. The law makes no exception. Ten dollars, ten days in jail. But before he finished the sentence, he was reaching for his wallet. And he took out ten dollars and dropped it in his sombrero. And then he says, I'm going to fine every one of you fifty cents each for making it that a little old lady has to steal a loaf of bread in our city to feed her starving grandchildren. That is grace. Do you get it? You get the drift? That is grace. Give and give him a standing ovation. Because the people, when he had said that, stood and applauded Mayor LaGuardia. You see, if you really understand the gospel, the true gospel, not the false gospel, but the true gospel, you'll understand that good works is just a standing ovation for what God has already done. Amen. What God has already done. That's grace. Now, three important things about our text in Ephesians chapter 8 and 9. There are three very important things. First of all, the need of salvation. By grace, it is the means of grace that we go to heaven. Secondly, it's the way, is by faith, the act of grace. And then there is the reward of our salvation, which is the reward of grace. There is need of grace, act of grace, and reward of grace. Too many people think that justification comes by faith and, and by grace, but then sanctification is the work of a lifetime. No, it's not the work of a lifetime. It's the work of God working on our life for a lifetime. It's still grace. It's still grace, the unmerited favor of God. We don't deserve it. None of you deserve it. I don't deserve it. I deserve to be lost. But this gracious, loving, caring God I've been talking about this week, this gracious God, He gives us grace. He gives us the unmerited favor. He gives us what He deserves so that we might give Him our hearts. Unmerited giving. It's a gift from above. Never forget that. Acceptance based upon the need and the desire of one who receives it. It's a new standing before God. I was saved, by the way, in 1954. I was 16 years old. I was a ruffian kid in the streets of Brooklyn. God saved me that moment. By the way, I was not saved to a degree and now more saved. God didn't put a down payment on your house. He paid for it. Why do you think you have to pay a mortgage? If he only paid the part and you have to pay the rest, then it's no longer a gift, is it? You don't say to your kid, who, oh, here's the little bicycle. 
It's $42. I paid $30 of it. I want you to pay the rest. It's no longer a gift. No longer. Don't you understand that it's so simple? It's like the nose on your face. And yet we get so mixed up. You see, listen to me. I was ready for heaven the moment I gave my life to Christ. I'm no more ready now after 50 years of serving him. And by the way, some people say, oh, I like the works. Hey, you like works? Then I'm way ahead of you. I've spent 50 years living in hotel rooms and going into the barrios and preaching the word of God and baptizing 15,000 people in the kingdom of Christ and this church. Listen to me. If good works, I'm ahead of you. Thank God it's grace. Thank God it's grace. The unmerited favor of God. I mean, I'm very suspicious of people who try to lay a heavy burden upon other people in these last days. Oh, we got to be different. Last day. No, God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Noah found grace in the sight of the Lord. Never forget it. I mean, it, we, we need to be better, purer. I mean, because we live in the last days. What heresy. God does not change. I change not. His salvation was by grace through faith, and it is a gift. It was a gift in the beginning. It is a gift now, even at this moment, as I receive him as the gift. In Matthew 24, verse 27, you'll notice what the Bible says in Matthew but as the days of Noah were, so shall also the days of the coming of the Son of Man be. Notice, the Son of Man, what? It will be, as the days of Noah, it shall be. Genesis 6 verse 8 tells us, Noah found grace in the sides of the Lord. By the way, he needed to find grace. He comes out of the ark, he gets drunk, he lies naked before his children. Surely, Noah needed grace. Found grace. Hmm. Boat builder found grace. He's an example of our generation because the Bible says this was the days of Noah. So shall it be in the what? Days of the coming of the Son of Man. And yet this perfect person gets out of the ark and he gets drunk and lays naked. His nakedness was covered by grace. Our generation be like that generation. Do you hear me? You'll be like that generation. Grace rescues us. Take a look at that powerful text found in Colossians, the second chapter. The second chapter of Colossians, and I'm reading here, and you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having given you all what? All the trespasses, having you forgiven all trespasses. God made you alive. I became alive when grace came. God forgave you. I was forgiven when God came. I mean, I was... The, the debt was canceled when God's grace came. I mean, God took away the record. I mean, God stripped the spiritual rulers. God won the victory. Why walk around like losers? You are victorious because Christ is victorious. God shows the whole world the way to victory. The question is, who is active? You or I? Or God? Who is trapped and who comes to rescue us? You are God. Who throws a life preserver? Oh, many of you read books about life saving. You've read all the books about life preservers, but you never had to wear one. Trapped. You know something? I'm not more saved now than I ever was when I first found the Lord. I enjoy my walk better. Romans chapter 1, verse 16 and 17. Listen to the word of God. Listen to what it says. The word of God. So as much as in me is, I'm ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome. Also, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power unto what? Come on, unto what? Yes. To everyone that believeth. The Bible, and to the Jew first, and also to the Greek, and therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it's written, the just shall live by faith. By faith. By faith. He calls it faith to faith. What is faith? Faith is trusting Jesus Christ for your salvation. I mean, faith 
to faith is trusting on a continuing basis in salvation. For everyday faith, it is the spirit that gives me faith. It is the spirit-filled life that fills me with faith to faith. And that allows me to visualize, accomplish, mountain-moving faith. It originates in my soul only as a gift of God. Salvation is always by faith. And that is why he says faith to faith. We begin our walk by trusting. Then somehow we get all messed up in our heads somehow. Maybe it's us preachers who have been filling you with this. Sorry. Sorry. We get so messed up and start trying. You talk about a person, how's your spiritual life? Oh, I'm trying. As if trying is going to help. As if receiving and keeping salvation is two different things. I don't receive it by faith and keep it by works. Not by works, lest any should what? Boast. Self-effort, self-sanctification, self-justification is not the way of faith. The way of faith is what he inspires in us. The process is so clear, we overlook it. God forgives us, accepts us, establishes us in the right relationship. He then goes on from faith to faith. He engenders a hunger in us, a hunger. When I first came to know Christ, I had a hunger in my heart. You didn't have to tell me. In fact, I'm tired of you telling me. You didn't have to tell me. The Holy Spirit told me. You didn't tell me you've got to give up this, give up that, give up that. The Holy Spirit moves. Not by work, self-justification. Listen to me, faith to faith. We cannot force ourselves to have faith. Faith can only originate in the soul by the gift of God. And by the way, it comes by the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. You can't have faith without the Holy Spirit. Don't ever think you're going to live without the Holy Spirit. You can't have faith without the Holy Spirit. You can't cry out to God without the Holy Spirit. You can't say your prayers without the Holy Spirit. It's the Spirit that convicts you and brings you to faith. In Luke, I mean in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, if I had time, I'd read it for you. But they have me on a clock. In this passage, we have 19 gifts of the Spirit. Did you notice them? The charismata. The grace gifts. The indwelling of the Holy Spirit. We, we study the Holy Spirit like it's a class. 101, Holy Spirit 101. It's not a class. It's an experience. It's sensing him. It's feeling him in your heart. It's being convicted when you get up on, off your knees. I mean, it's the Holy Spirit that enwraps around you. It's the Holy Spirit that makes you look towards Christ. It's the Holy Spirit that makes you want to pray. It's the Holy Spirit that makes you want to do for God. It's the Holy Spirit. Give him glory and credit too. Amen. No one can say, Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. If you are of the belief that someday you'll live without the Holy Spirit, you are a deluded people. That is what Paul said. You would not be able to say in that day, come Lord Jesus, because it's the Holy Spirit that puts it in your mouth. It's the Holy Spirit that puts it in your eyes. It's the Holy Spirit that puts it in your ears so you hear God. And it's nurtured and grown by faith and trust and belief. It means those of us who have been given the capacity to trust Christ unreservedly for our salvation are now afforded a special confidence to believe what he can and will do in our circumstances. It's a mountain-moving faith. The faith that does not shrink from the task. The faith that sees what God wants to be done and sees that it's done. I always marvel at this station here. Because when you first started, vision. You saw something. Your leader saw something. And it was out of that. Magnifying faith. You see what's happening now. 
You see, the person who has the gift of faith asks, what does God want? What does he want in this particular situation? What would Jesus do in this particular situation? I mean, what does he expect in particular circumstance? First, faith asks it. Secondly, faith has the courage to believe that it will be done. We all live on the edge of some complexity. Listen to me. Most of us unexpected little, little from God, and that's why we're not disappointed. The majority of Christians I know do not have a lively expectancy which comes from faith. Faith seen is the gifted life. They have enough faith to accept Christ at Calvary, but they don't have enough faith to accept Him in our culture, in our moment, when our need. Now the question is, how do I get it? Well, the answer is clear. It's the nose on your face. More of the Holy Spirit. The one who enables to believe in the beginning will help you meet the challenge of the future, the moving of faith to faith to faith to faith to faith. Not faithful, mind you, to faith. Got to be more faithful than the is it? Faith. If you haven't asked Jesus Christ for eternal salvation, ask him now. You can write at this moment. You can ask him now. Boldly claim the gift of faith. And if you've never known the enable and power of faith, then you who are here at church, you've never known the indwelling, the overflowing of, of the Holy Spirit in your life, then ask it now. It's a wonderful story about a first grader. A little boy, he was leaving the class his last day, and he shook the hand of the teacher, and he said, Teacher, I really like you. I sure wish I could stay here forever. But I've been promoted. Boy, I wish you knew enough to teach me in the second grade. <laughs> we laugh at that. And then we know the Holy Spirit who gave us the gift of primary faith knows more than enough to give us powerful faith. Amen. For instance, what, what is faith? Well, if I had a chair, I, I'm sitting on a chair, and, and there's a chair over there. I say, uh, will that chair hold me? You say, well, I don't know. Well, you'd have to get up and walk over and sit on that chair, right? You see, I get up off the chair, and I walk over, and I sit on that. Before I knew Christ, before I knew salvation, before I knew the gift of eternal life, I was sitting on myself. I was depending upon myself, and then all of a sudden it dawned on me. I needed to go over, and I needed to put my weight on Jesus Christ. And that's powerful faith. The faith that unshackles us. I was a pastor in Cleveland, Tennessee, and I worked in, uh, in prison ministry. And I worked with a young man at the prison, and he gave his life to Christ. It was a real transformation of his, of his life. You can't, come, you can't come into the presence of Jesus and not be changed. His life was changed. One day when I was visiting him, he says, Pastor Ron, he says, I, I really want to be baptized. And so I went to the prison officials. I said, he needs to be baptized. Well, we don't have a baptistry here. I said, well, I have one in my church. So well, I don't know if we can do that. I said, no, the man, and, and they saw a transformation. And so they said, all right, Thursday afternoon. So I went and filled up the water and got it ready and in walked the prisoner, shackled. Shackled. He walked in and I said, take those shackles off him. He's a born-again Christian. He's new in Christ. I said, he said, well, I don't know if we can, but they did. He went down in the water, and I baptized him in the kingdom of God. He came up. The glow, the beauty in his face. Went back to prison to serve his term. And I moved away from the church, but the church would get a tithe envelope every so often from this box number in Tennessee. And they'd send it, and the name, and one day the church was sanctimoniously sitting in a board meeting, wondering what the church manual says about a person who doesn't attend church, and they forgot they should have asked Emmanuel. <laughs> Get the drift? But anyway. And so they, they said, well, 
what is this person? I never see him at church. And, and then the treasurer said, oh, oh, he sends faithfully offerings and tithes from a box number. A few years later, a man walked into the church in cheap suit. And they said, oh, are you a visitor, a guest? They said, no, I'm a member. He told them the story. Unshackled. Unshackled. That's the story of grace. And that's the story of quantum grace. Milt Hammerley talks about quantum grace. I like that. Listen to what he says. Barely visible mustard seed. Mover of mountains. Ever smaller we search for the ultimate indivisible. We find unimaginable force from an atom split. Yet even electrons, muons and beyonds, infinitesimal, invisible and still divisible by the lowest and the highest common denominator. Faith, the smallest and the greatest, the evidence of things hoped for, the substance of things not seen, the building block of all that matters, the power of the infinite at our disposal. I like that. That's grace through faith, the unmerited gift of God's giving, of God's giving. Years ago, and I tell this story wherever I go, and you've heard it perhaps. If you haven't, you should. And if you have, you'll hear it better. It gets better with the telling. I was sent to Harlem. The brethren were sent to the Philippines. Get the drift. And so I was there in January in Harlem. January. And I was to preach the Word of God. The first night I stood up to preach, and the church was packed out. They had to get on the subway, and they had to go through the snow, and they had to get on the buses, and those people, but they were faithful. We, if the raindrops are falling, we stay home. We can see it on 3ABN. Give me a break. I hope the second coming comes through 3ABN, or else some of you will be left behind. <laughs> and so I was preaching, and I noticed in, in the second row a woman with a black afro, I mean with a gold afro, big gold afro. Now I teach preaching in some of our colleges and, and I told my preachers, don't keep looking at the same people or else they'll think you're preaching about them. And so I looked in gold afro, I mean you can hardly miss it. And so I tried to turn away, and, but everywhere I turned I, I looked and <laughs> I saw that gold afro and, and on the way out is as, as the people coming by are shaking their hands, she shook my hand. She says, hi, I'm Goldie. Oh, I said, yeah. <laughs> she went out in the night and the usher, uh, or the deacon came over. He says, you know who she is? I said, yeah, Goldie. He says, no, she's the prostitute from 145th Street, Amsterdam Avenue. Now, I never knew how the deacon knew that, but anyway. <laughs> and so me being who I am, I did a holy dance. Can't show you Adventists, but when I get to heaven, I'll show you it. I went home and prayed that night. Couldn't sleep that night. All night I prayed for Goldie. She'd come back and listen to the Word of God, that Jesus would take her heart. Amen. Next night she was there, and the next night, and the next night, and the next... And I'm, by that time, I'm in the third heaven preaching from the third heaven. And one night she comes out, I said, Goldie, I'm going to come visit you. Her head dropped. She said, oh, preacher, you don't want to visit me where I work, because where I work, I live. You see, I never read in the Scripture... Office hours between 10 and 12. Give me a break here. What's happened to us? We're so professional. What's happened to us? I said, no. I need you know where I'm going to come. She said, oh, but pastor, I work where I live and I live where I work. I said, that's all right. I'll be there. Would Thursday afternoon be all right? Two o'clock. On the way home, I said to my wife, I said, honey, I'm going to House of Prostitution, 145th Street on Thursday. Would you like to come? She said, Yeah. 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 Drove out on Thursday. My wife parked a car. I took my Bible. You keep out of trouble with your Bible. And I old told you the other night I, when I visit in the inner cities, whether it's in the barrios of Los Angeles or of San Bernardino, I carry my Bible. They got to shoot through Genesis, Exodus, Viticus to get to me. And I, ran, I said to my wife, I said, pray. And she kept the car running and praying. And I ran up the stairs down the hall. The customers were waiting. I knocked on the door. They said, hey, man, where are you going? I said, I'm going to see Goldie. Gave him my best Christian smile. 
He said, so are we. I said, yeah, but for the wrong reason. I'm a preacher. That got him nervous. <laughs> I knocked on the door. She said, oh, pa-. I said, who is it? I said, Brother Ron, Pastor Ron. She said, oh, Pastor, wait. And I waited a customer to go out, and, and I went in. And what do you say? What do you preach? Come on, 2,300 days? Come on. What do you talk about? Healthful living? Come on. What do you preach about? The Sabbath? Get real. You tell them that there's a God in heaven that loves them. And this God doesn't want them to perish. And he, he loved them with such a, a cost, he gave his own son. You tell them that there's a God who loves them. And I said, Goldie, I said, Jesus loves you. And she started to cry. And I started to cry too, the big lug. She says, you know, I learned something in Sunday school. By the way, I met prostitutes from Sunday school and I met some from Sabbath school. And I, she said, I learned something in Sunday school when I was a little child. I said, what is it? A song. I said, a song? Yeah, what is it? Jesus loves me. This I know. For the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. I said, that's it. The older I get, the more I understand. That's it. That's it. Jesus loves me. This I know. And there I led her to her knees to pray. And I said, Goldie, say a prayer. She said, I can't. I don't know how to pray. I said, well, just talk to Jesus. He loves you. Just talk to Jesus as you love. She said, I don't know how to love. I said, just just tell him what's in your heart. I heard the most beautiful prayer I've ever heard this side of glory. Prostitute, 145th Street, Amsterdam Avenue, Goldie. And she, a few days later, she came forward to give her life to Christ. She received the unmerited favor of God. And she became a Bible worker to serve God now and be with God forever. The unmerited giving is yours.